this episode of Beans and Antiquity is being recorded at 4 p.m. on the 7th of February 2018, hosted by Chloe Mix Trussler and Alexis Simpson. Welcome to Beans and Antiquity, where we drink coffee and talk about history. Today I'm going to be telling Alexis all about the rivalry between Elizabeth I of England and Mary I of Scotland. Ready? Yes. Okay. Queen Elizabeth I of England was born in 1533 to Anne Boleyn and King Henry VIII. King Henry had her mother beheaded when she was two years old. As a child of Henry, she had clear claim to the English throne. However, this was contested as she was considered illegitimate by many. Protestants considered her illegitimate due to Henry's annulment of his marriage to Anne, and Catholics didn't consider the marriage legitimate to begin with because Henry had divorced his previous wife. Next in line to the throne would be Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, and when Mary the First of England dies, she was also the Queen of France. She was born in 1542 as the daughter of Marie de Guise and James V of Scotland. Her father was killed in battle when she was six days old, and Mary was immediately crowned queen. Like Elizabeth, Mary was a granddaughter of Henry VII, and unlike Elizabeth, Mary's birth and that of her father were completely uncontested. While Mary still has the problem of being a woman, she has no issues with birth legitimacy. Beyond that, Mary was Catholic while Elizabeth was Protestant, giving Mary support from the Vatican as well as a friendly disposition from Spain, France, and other powerful Catholic countries. So before we dig more into the rivalry, there are some important things to know, starting with a super creepy dude. Okay. Okay. So... Henry VIII died in 1547, making Elizabeth's half-brother, Edward VI, king at age nine. Edward's mother and the queen dowager, Catherine Parr, married later that year. She married Thomas Seymour, the first Baron Seymour of Sudley, who was Edward's uncle and the brother of the Lord Protector of England. Elizabeth went to live with the queen and Lord Seymour. The Lord was nearly 40 years old, while Elizabeth was only 14. Okay. And I point that out because Lord Seymour was one creepy dude. Okay. Jeez. He began visiting Elizabeth's bedchambers early in the morning to, quote, romp in her bed. And the queen would sometimes join him. Um. (laughs) This one is especially weird and creepy. The queen and the Lord teased Elizabeth in the garden. The queen held her while Lord Seymour cut up her morning gown for her father. What? (laughs) The extent of what happened between Seymour and Elizabeth is unknown, most likely to preserve her reputation. Elizabeth began to wake up early to dress before the Lord arrived in her chambers, and after the Lord and Elizabeth were repeatedly found alone together, the queen suggested it would be best if Elizabeth left. However, this is not the end of Elizabeth's troubles with the ultra-creepy Lord Seymour. In 1548, the Queen died in childbirth, and soon after Lord Seymour began to seek Elizabeth's hand in marriage and was turned down. Seymour was jealous of his brother's power over the boy king and plotted to take his power. He planned to abduct the king and marry him to Lady Jane Grey whilst marrying himself to Elizabeth. His plan failed, and he was executed for treason. Freaking good. (laughs) Creepy dude. Yeah. Um, This plot brought up questions of Elizabeth's loyalty to the king, as many thought she may have been complicit in the plot. Why was this an issue? It was high treason for an heir to the throne to marry without permission from the monarch, the privy council, and parliament. Her servants were arrested and sent to the tower, and Elizabeth herself was put under close guard and interrogated by Sir Robert Tyrwhitt, who said, I do see it in her face that she is guilty. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> what did he see in her face? That she was guilty. I just keep, I just keep gesturing. <laughs> do you think she was guilty? No, <laughs> she said no. She didn't want to get married to him, so why would she have been a part of the plot? And obviously, she thought he was creepy and didn't want to be around him because she started getting up earlier so that she didn't have to, like, change when he was around. I don't know. A lot of people thought that she might have had a teenage crush on him. He was... Yeah, 40-year-old dude. Because that's what all teenagers... 
She was supposed to be very charming. Okay, charming and attractive are two different things. <laughs> so now, Edward the Sixth died in 1553, having named Lady Jane Grey as his heir, sweeping both his sisters aside. Lady Jane was the granddaughter of Henry VIII's sister, Mary Tudor, who was the Queen of France. Lady Jane was put on the throne by the Privy Council, but had little support and was removed after nine days. <laughs> Less than a month after Edward's death, Mary returned to London as Queen with Elizabeth at her side. Now, this support between the sisters very quickly faded due to Mary's religious intolerance. As a devout Catholic, Mary demanded that everyone attend Mass, including her Protestant sister. Then, when Mary announced her plans to marry the Catholic Prince Philip of Spain, her support began to fade, and many turned to Elizabeth as a potential ruler. Elizabeth was imprisoned in the Tower, then in Woodstock, under suspicion of involvement with a Protestant rebellion in 1554. Elizabeth was then called back to court in 1555 to attend the final stages of her sister's apparent pregnancy, as she would take the throne if both Mary and the baby died. When it became clear that Mary was not pregnant, most no longer believed that she could have a baby. Prince Philip became King Philip in 1556, then in October of 1558, Philip consulted with Elizabeth in the hopes of making her his wife after Mary died. So his current wife and her sister, still alive right then, yeah. when he's trying to get Elizabeth to marry him. Okay. Okay. In November, Mary named Elizabeth her heir, and later the same month, Mary died and Elizabeth ascended to the throne. At this point, Elizabeth is a 25-year-old, unmarried, Protestant woman, so a large majority of Europe is extremely unhappy with her on the throne. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me for the time period. Okay, so now we can move on to young Mary of Scots in France. Okay. So, because she was crowned at six days old, throughout the entire thing, Mary is queen. Mm -hmm. Okay. In 1547, which is one year before Elizabeth was sent away from Lord Seymour, Mary was five years old. A marriage agreement was created to unite France and Scotland through Mary and the three-year-old Dauphin of France, Francis. <laughs> Mary was sent to France for her safety and lived there until she was 18. She was accompanied to France by her own court, including two illegitimate brothers, four noble girls her own age, all named Mary, and an appointed governess. Mary was well-loved at court by all except Catherine de' Medici, Henry II's wife and queen. In 1558, Mary signed an agreement that would give Scotland to France if she were to die without issue, before marrying Francis at the Notre Dame. In 1559, Henry II was killed in a jousting match, making Francis and Mary king and queen of France, as well as Scotland. In 1560, King Francis died of a middle ear infection. The grieving Queen Mary stayed in France for nine months before returning to Scotland. So then, in 1561, Mary sent a representative to English court to encourage Queen Elizabeth to name her as heir presumptive. Elizabeth refused to name any heir, fearing that it would lead to conspiracy against her. In 1563, Elizabeth proposed that English Lord Robert Dudley would be a good match for Mary, offering to declare Mary her heir if she accepted. However, Dudley was unwilling and nothing came of the engagement. It's also worth mentioning that most of English court thought that Elizabeth and Lord Dudley were lovers. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> She's marrying off her lover. Yeah. Probably to end conspiracy about it, I guess. Like, talk about it. If he was married. That, that is a theory. <laughs> Mary married Lord Darnley in 1565. Both Mary and Lord Darnley were grandchildren of Mary Tudor. Okay, so, so they're cousins, first of all. But I guess that's not surprising at the time. It was a point of controversy that they didn't get approval from the Catholic Church because, um, at that point, first cousins could get married without it being considered incest as long as the Church approved it. Oh, so they have to just, like, decide if this time it's incest? Yes. Like... Brothers and sisters, 
could never. First cousins needed approval, and then second cousin and beyond, you're fine. Darnley became increasingly insistent on being granted the crown matrimonial. And do you know what that is? No. Okay. The crown matrimonial would be given to the consort. So if it's king consort, then given to the king. Queen consort, given to the queen. And basically it's so that if their spouse, who is the actual heir to that throne, mm-hmm. dies without having a child, then the throne is going to go to their consort. Instead of, like, someone else in the bloodline. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. But Darnley became increasingly insistent on being granted the crown matrimonial, which Mary continued to refuse him. All right. Which then put a strain on their marriage, despite that they had conceived in October of 1565. In early 1566, Darnley joined a conspiracy against Mary, and on March 9th, a group of conspirators, joined by Darnley, infiltrated the Edinburgh Castle and killed David Rizzio, who was Mary's secretary and close friend, in front of the pregnant queen. All right. Over the next two days, Darnley switched sides and helped Mary to escape the castle. Mary's son James was born in June of 1566, at which time Mary and several Scottish nobles began to discuss the, quote, problem of Darnley. Around Christmas of 1566, Darnley returned to his father's estate while suffering from an ailment that could have been caused by a fever, smallpox, syphilis, or poison. That's a pretty wide range there. It is. (laughs) And all of them can cause madness. In January of 1667, Mary prompted Darnley to return to Edinburgh. Darnley stayed in the house of a noble just inside the city wall to recuperate. Mary visited him every day so that it seemed like a reconciliation was underway. It was not. (laughs) On the night of February 9th and the morning of the 10th, Mary visited Darnley in the early evening and then attended a wedding at court. In the early morning, the home Darnley was staying in exploded. And Darnley's body was found in the garden, apparently smothered. What? (laughs) That was a plot twist. I wasn't ready for it. Okay, so if he was smothered, did they not even try to pretend that the explosion is what killed him then? Okay, so what happened was that the people I'm about to list supposedly planted gunpowder in the house and lit a fuse so it would like explode mm-hmm. like it's it's what happened 1500s bomb yeah okay and then darnley wasn't actually killed or injured in the explosion and went out into the garden and those that were trying to kill him like yeah. saw that he was still alive and just like killed him but there weren't marks on him like that he had obviously been strangled or anything which is why it says smothered the reasoning is that he had escaped and by the point they had actually killed him like an explosion kind of draws people so there were probably already people coming before they had a chance to make it look like he just burned that makes sense yeah okay And among those under suspicion were Lord Bothwell, who is rumored to be Mary's lover, the Earl of Murray, Mary's brother, and William Maitland, Mary's secretary, as well as Mary herself. Elizabeth wrote to Mary of these rumors. I should ill fulfill the office of a faithful cousin or an affectionate friend if I did not tell you what all the world is thinking. Men say that instead of seizing the murderers, you are looking through your fingers while they escape, that you will not seek revenge on those who have done you so much pleasure, as though the deed would never have taken place had not the doers of it been assured of impunity. For myself, I beg of you to believe that I would not harbor such a thought. Darnley's father insisted that Bothwell be put to trial for assassination, to which Mary agreed. But Bothwell got off and further convinced more than two dozen lords to support his aims to marry Mary. In April 1667, Mary saw her son for the last time in Stirling. When she was on her way back to Edinburgh, she was abducted. We don't know if it was willing or unwilling. 
by Lord Bothwell and his men, then taken to Dunbar Castle, where he may have raped her. Okay, wait, which one is Bothwell? Um, he's the one that may have been her lover. Okay. In early May, Bothwell and Mary returned to Edinburgh, where they were married by Protestant rites, as Bothwell's first wife had been divorced only a few days prior. Wow. So, Catholics would not recognize the marriage. Yeah. Both Protestant and Catholic nobles thought the marriage was wrong, and an army of Confederate lords was raised to dethrone Mary and Bothwell. They met this army at Carberry Hill, where nearly Mary's entire army deserted her. Bothwell was given safe passage from the field, and Mary was taken back to Edinburgh, where she was denounced as an adulteress and murderer. She was then imprisoned in Lochleven Castle on June 16th, Then in July, she miscarried twins, and days later was forced to abdicate the throne in favor of her one-year-old son. Oh my god. (laughs) Her brother became regent while Bothwell was imprisoned in Denmark and eventually died of madness in 1578. On May 2nd, 1578, Mary escaped Lochleven with the help of the brother of the castle's owner. She raised an army of about 6,000 men and met Marie's smaller forces at the Battle of Langside, which she lost. Then, she fled to England by fishing boat in mid-May and was taken into protective custody at Carlisle Castle on May 18th. Fun fact, I've been there. Hmm. Mary had expected Elizabeth to help her regain her throne, but Elizabeth ordered an inquiry into the Confederate lords and whether or not Mary had killed Darnley. As an anointed queen, Mary refused to acknowledge the power of a court to try her, but sent a representative. The inquiry lasted from October 1568 to January 1569, while in Scotland Mary's supporters fought a civil war against Regent Moray. As evidence against Mary, Moray presented the casket letters, eight unsigned letters supposedly from Mary to Bothwell, two marriage contracts, and love sonnets said to have been found in a silver gilt casket less than one foot long, decorated with the monogram of King Francis II. And with that, let's remember that King Francis II is Mary's first husband. So it's it being found in that would probably, if it were planted, signify that like the person who planted it was trying to insinuate that it was Mary's because she had brought it with her from France. Mm -hmm. And if it actually was Mary's, then it was probably like something that had sentimental value. Yeah. The authenticity of these letters is widely debated, and the originals, which were written in French, were destroyed by Mary's son in 1584, while the surviving copies, both French and English, do not form a complete set. And James destroying the letters has been used as evidence for both sides. So some people say that first, the reason that it took the Scots a long time to give England the letters and the fact that Mary's son later destroyed them showed that they were true because they didn't want to betray their queen. Mm -hmm. But the other side says that it takes so long because they took that time to create the letters and that Mary's son destroyed them because they were false. Yeah, so, like, both sides definitely, I think, makes a lot of sense. That's terrible. I hate that. And because we don't have the originals, Mm -hmm. we can't really tell. Some people say that the way they're written and the fringe that they are written in isn't eloquent enough to have been written by Mary. But other people say that some aspects of the prose and the way that things are written is similar to other things Mary had written. Hmm. So every part of it, the evidence can be turned either way. At the end of the trial, no one was found guilty, either the Lords or Mary. But no one was found innocent either. The whole trial was a political exercise meant to ensure that Scotland would stay Protestant and Mary would stay in England without Elizabeth having to condemn anyone. In 1569, Mary was moved to Tutbury Castle in the custody of the Earl of Shrewsbury. She was confined to the four properties of Shrewsbury and occasionally let outside under strict supervision. Mary had her own domestic staff, never never numbering less than 16, and required 30 carts to take her belongings between properties. And now we're going to talk about plots, trial, and execution. 
Wow. <laughs> okay. Starting with plots. In May of 1569, Elizabeth attempted to mediate Mary's restoration to the throne in return for guarantees of the Protestant religion in Scotland. But the proposal was rejected. By Mary? Or... No. Like, Mary would have loved that. Yeah, I'm like, who? No, it was rejected by the Privy Council. Oh, okay. Which, if you didn't know... Um, privy councils were a thing in pretty much all feudal monarchies. Um, they were usually between eight and twelve lords that owned a lot of property, and those lords had power over the monarch, both as advisors and they could reject different decisions. And they could really easily turn other nobles against the monarch to dethrone them if the monarch continued making decisions the lords hated. The Lord of Norfolk schemed to marry Mary. After denying his intention to do so to his queen, and was imprisoned in the tower from 1569 to 1570. The following year, Murray was assassinated during a rebellion of Catholic earls, which persuaded Elizabeth that Mary was a threat. In 1571, Elizabeth's secretaries uncovered the Rodolfi plot, which was a plan to replace Elizabeth with Mary with the help of Spanish troops and the Lord of Norfolk. Norfolk was executed, and the Parliament introduced a bill to bar Mary from the English throne, which Elizabeth refused. Plots against Mary continued until 1584, when she proposed an association with her son. Mary was ready to stay in England, retire, abandon her claim to the English throne, while allowing England to remain Protestant and give Elizabeth power over who James would marry, under only one condition, and that was that her containment would immediately be alleviated. And James agreed for a while, but ultimately rejected it and signed an alliance treaty with Elizabeth, who also rejected the offer. And then in February of 1585, William Perry was convicted of attempting to assassinate Elizabeth without Mary's knowledge. However, her agent was implicated, and Mary was moved to the stricter custody of Sir Amias Paulette. Now, to the trial. In August of 1586, Mary was arrested after being implicated in a plot to assassinate Elizabeth and put Mary on the English throne. Mary was put on trial for treason under the Act for the Queen's Safety. Mary denied the charges and told her trials, Look to your consciences and remember that the theatre of the whole world is wider than the Kingdom of England. She protested that she was not allowed a proper defense as she had no access to the evidence against her and was denied legal counsel. Further, she argued that as a foreign queen, she was never an English citizen and as such could not be tried for treason. On October 25th, Mary was sentenced to death. Elizabeth was hesitant to order the death of another queen because of the precedent that it would set. Well, she wasn't a queen anymore though, right? She'd been, like, gotten rid of. No, like, once you are a queen, you don't really stop being a queen ever. She just, like, lost her power as a queen, I guess? Yes. Okay. It's because she had been anointed as a queen, which is basically, like, once you've had a coronation, like, that's it. You're queen forever. At the beginning, when we were talking about Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour, yeah. um, Catherine Parr was still a queen, even though uh, Henry VIII had died, she just became the queen dowager. So she didn't have any power over government, but she was still a queen. Okay, okay, that makes sense. But anyway, on October 25th, Mary was sentenced to death. Elizabeth was hesitant to order the death of another queen because of the precedent that it would set and fearful of the reaction Mary's son might have. On February 1st, Elizabeth signed the death warrant, and on February 3rd, ten members of the Privy Council decided to carry out the sentence at once without Elizabeth's knowledge. All right. On the evening of February 7th in 1587, Mary was told that she would be executed the next morning. She spent her last hours praying, giving her belongings to members of her household, and writing her will, as well as a letter to the King of France. Execution. In the Great Hall, where she was to be executed, the executioner and his assistant asked for forgiveness, as was typical, and Mary responded, I forgive you with all of my heart, and for now, I hope, you shall make an end of all of my troubles. 
Her servants and executioners helped Mary to remove her outer clothing, revealing a velvet petticoat and sleeves in crimson brown, the color of martyrdom in the Catholic Church, with a black satin bodice and black trim. As she undressed, she smiled and said that she had never had such grooms before, nor ever put off my clothes in such a company. Her servant blindfolded her with a white veil embroidered in gold. She then knelt before the block, and her last words were, In manus tuas demine commendo spiritum meum, which translates to, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. She was not beheaded with a single blow. The first missed her neck and hit the back of her head. The second severed all but a bit of sinew, which the executioner cut through, before lifting her head and declaring God save the queen. At that moment, the head fell to the ground, as Mary's auburn hair turned out to be a wig, revealing that Mary really had short gray hair. Following this, a small dog owned by the queen was found among her skirts. It was covered in blood and refused to be removed from its owner's body. It had to be forcefully taken away and washed. Following the beheading, all of Mary's clothes were burned in the fireplace of the Great Hall. When the news of Mary's execution reached Elizabeth, she insisted that the Privy Council had acted without her authority, removing herself from the crime. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth denied Mary's request to be buried in France, and had her embalmed and put in a lead coffin, then buried in a Protestant service at Peterborough Cathedral in July of 1587. Her entrails were secretly buried in Fothering Hay Castle. In 1612, the now king, James VI and I, had his mother's body exhumed and interred in Westminster Abbey in a chapel opposite the tomb of Elizabeth. I think there were a lot of weird things going on there. Yeah. God save the queen, head falls. Like, that's weird. <laughs> she was wearing a wig. What a way to have that found out. I guess she was dead, so she didn't care. The dog that was just in her skirt the whole time, I guess? First off, with the, the execution is just really weird. Because first, she is very collected. And then the executioner messes up doing it cleanly. And then the head falls. And then the dog runs out of the skirts. That's not normal. <laughs> None of that is normal. <laughs> she was like, I'm gonna surprise them. I think the casket letters are really weird. Yeah, and the controversy surrounding them is also weird. It would have been nice if James hadn't burned them, regardless of which side it implies, because then they could be, like, actually, like, forensically yeah, examined. Like, at the time, the handwriting was examined, and it was seen to match Mary's. But Mary did, like, a type of calligraphy, so it wouldn't be hard to copy. Yeah, if you also do that type of calligraphy. Yeah, like... And, like, even now, handwriting analysis, especially if they're not, like, computer analysis, are, like, debated about accuracy. Yes. And, so. like, secretaries in the French castle, like, were all trained in the exact same type of calligraphy. Yeah, so, so that you could not same. tell. Yeah. Yeah. So... Definitely easy to fake. Yes. And the fact that they weren't signed. Yeah. So a lot of people said that either they were from Mary, but they were to someone else, or that they were to Bothwell, but they were from someone else. Okay. That makes sense. You know, but a lot of the men working in the inquiry um, were, like, said at the time that if the casket letters were real, then Mary was absolutely guilty. But Elizabeth didn't want Mary to be found guilty. Yeah. I also thought it was kind of interesting that, it, like, for a lot of it, it seemed like Elizabeth cared less about her image and more about actually protecting Mary, and then towards the end, even though she was, like, hesitant about it, she still was like, yeah, kill her. Well, I she guess definitely plot, didn't have but... a choice. Yeah. Like, Elizabeth her whole time on the throne she's in like a really precarious position mm -hmm. because like all of these surrounding really powerful countries and the Vatican want her gone oh, yeah. and there were lots of plots like including ones by the Vatican to kill her and also like plots from Protestants and like John Knox who was this really influential Protestant minister and mm -hmm. I think he was Scottish 
but um, he preached very vocally against both Elizabeth and Mary because he said it was unnatural for women to rule. Oh my god. Um, yeah, but, like, there were all of these different, like, factions of people, like, plotting against her that wanted to yeah. dethrone her and preferably replace her with a Catholic man. That also, I think, makes it interesting that so many times she was willing to, like, despite her reputation, defend Mary. It sounded like there were things that, like, she definitely, it would have been better to do Yes, the like, after Mary was directly implicated in that assassination attempt, mm-hmm. Elizabeth had to kill her because if she didn't then that would be leaving herself open to more people trying to assassinate her Mm -hmm. because she'd be setting that precedent for people being able to try to assassinate her and get away with it which is also part of why she didn't kill mary before that and why she was so hesitant to kill mary even then Mm -hmm. because that sets the precedent for killing a monarch which none of the european monarchs wanted oh well yeah also, James being involved in the way that he was was interesting to me. Like, the fact that, first of all, the burning, the letters, but also, like, that he was willing to side with Elizabeth against his mom in that situation that he did. Well, he never knew Mary. He knew Elizabeth. That's something I didn't necessarily consider. Because, yeah, I guess she, he only knew her for, like, the first few months of his life, so he never, like, knew her. When he stopped going along with it, that was probably more the right choice because that like secured him a solid reign over both Scotland and England yeah that wouldn't be contested by anyone I realized that for two entire nations she was a pretty absent monarch like she wasn't there well for most of her life she ruled Scotland from France that's true Um, And she had a regent, which her mother was regent of Scotland. And then after her mother died, her brother James was regent of Scotland. And he was also the regent for James VI. I think Mary is really interesting because she had claims to so many thrones. And then ended up with none of them. Well, I mean, she was Queen of Scotland and France at the same time. Yeah, but, like, not for long. I mean, that's very relative. What was a long time in the 1500s? That's true. Because, like, when Mary was 16 and Francis was 14, they got married. And he died, like, I think not quite a year later. So then she went back to Scotland when she was, like, 18. But yeah, by birth, Mary had the Scottish throne. She had reason to try to take the English throne and married into the French throne. Yeah, so she she really could have been a very big threat. And then Darnley. There's a lot going on there. Why did he like suddenly change his mind about killing her? I wonder. Like he he switched sides. He did switch sides. He wasn't expecting Rizzio to be brutally murdered in front of his pregnant wife like that. Oh, okay. What happened when they killed him was, it was kind of a Caesar thing, where like one guy stabbed him and then all of the other guys stabbed him too, so the murder wasn't just on one of them. Jeez. Yeah. In front of like his pregnant friend that happened to him. Yes. That's terrible. And... I guess thinking about it, Darnley might have had some sort of motive of, like, I do have a child with this person. Yeah, and and with his illness, especially if it was poison or syphilis, yeah. both of which were pretty likely, um, it was really likely that he was suffering from madness. It's true. Which also could have been part of his decision to plot against Mary. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And also, another thing with Rizzio, a lot of historians have theorized that he may have been gay. They really had no cause to do it other than to cause Mary pain. Oh, yeah, like, because it they wasn't, obviously weren't And Rizzio actually wasn't even Scottish or French. He was Italian. He was originally an Italian merchant, and he met Mary not long after she came to Scotland, and they became friends, and that's why he was her secretary. That makes me really sad. <laughs> poor Mary. <laughs> like, I mean, all of it, it's like, poor Mary, but like, that part specifically. Yeah, she had a really traumatic life. So did Elizabeth. Probably. 
Like, yeah. The situation her, that she was in. Her mother was beheaded when she was three. Um, her father denounced her and, like, completely abandoned her. Mm-hmm. She was... Um, as a teenager, a yeah. she was probably raped. Um, like, beyond that, once she was queen and she was really powerful, she still had constant assassination attempts and threats mm-hmm. and... She had to make decisions, like, for the sake of staying in power and not being killed herself, killing someone that she did not want to kill. Like, yes. she had to have that kind of thing. And, like, especially with the execution of Mary, either thing was bad. Like, if she doesn't kill Mary, like, she opens herself to more assassination attempts. Yeah, because, because they're not going to be punished. Yes. And then if she does kill Mary, she's open to more assassination attempts because she set a precedent for killing monarchs. Which means more people want to kill her. And, like, she's shown that... It, either way, she's shown that it's okay. Yeah. Like, the best thing that could have happened is for the Privy Council to do it without without her permission. Because then she has plausible deniability, especially with the vague instructions she gave. And it would have been nice if, since they actually did kill her without Elizabeth knowing, if they would have just done it before they got Elizabeth to sign the death warrant. But I guess then all of them would have had to no. be punished. Yeah, all of them would have had to be imprisoned. But... My attempted implication there was that Elizabeth did know and she told them to pretend she didn't. That is her only way out of the situation. And I think it's a little convenient to that for that to have accidentally happened unless her privy council was really there for her, which they weren't. Like a lot of her privy council had to be replaced at different times because they plotted against her. <laughs> she had a hard time. I mean, I think that was kind of a theme for uh, solely in power female monarchs. So I think most of the reason she even got onto the throne is because her sister was Bloody Mary that like yeah. killed all the Protestants. <laughs> like... <laughs> and it was a Protestant country, so of course they wanted the next in line Protestant. Mm. Thanks for listening, and maybe soon we'll return with more Beans and Antiquity.